Okay, we're on. So I would like to start, um, <clears throat> sorry, let me start by introducing myself. I'm David Pitt. I'm the chair of the philosophy department at Cal State LA, where Joseph worked for many years. And I'd like to welcome you to this uh, memorial lecture and discussion in his honor. And I would like to um, say a few things about Joseph in relation to the department and as a colleague um, before handing off um, to our two main speakers today. So Joseph came to Cal State LA in 1978 after our department had a two year search in 19th century philosophy. We are a philosophically pluralistic department. In particular, we strive to maintain a balance between two traditional approaches to philosophy, the British American analytic tradition, excuse me, and the continental tradition, which were for many years considered to be fundamentally incompatible in their aims and methods. Joseph was the perfect hire for our department, having studied in Germany at the universities of Munich and Heidelberg, and then at Cambridge University, finally earning his PhD from Boston University, and having the ability to exploit the best these traditions had to offer, while also vastly expanding the scope and vision of the department and introducing curricula from traditions outside of this narrow uh, analytic continental divide. In addition to teaching well over 10,000 students over the years in intro to philosophy, he taught a wide range of contemporary continental philosophy, hermeneutics, critical theory, and post-structuralism included. He taught both East Asian and South Asian philosophy, comparative Buddhisms, nonviolence, post-colonial theory, and neoliberalism. At Cal State, Joseph was given the university-wide outstanding professor award, and he was also a visiting professor at Berkeley, Chicago, and Harvard. Joseph also, uh, let me just pause here to ask everyone to mute so we don't get background interference. I'll do it for you. Okay. Um, I, I, David, you, yeah. you, might, you might lower the camera so we can see your face while you're talking. Are you sure you want to see my face? <laughs> okay, I'm also, I'm reading from something, so that makes oh. it difficult. You'll, you'll, you'll get to see plenty of my faces okay. as we go on. Um, okay, Joseph also enjoyed working with graduate students on their MA theses, and he kept up over the years with many of the students he supervised. The rest of us were very grateful that he could take on the variety of subjects in which they were interested, and it's something that we are uh, struggling with now. We have students interested in topics that nobody here teaches anymore <laughs> since Joseph and Ricardo and some other people um, left. Joseph's intellectual, spiritual, and activist worlds were all very expansive. He was by training and inclination multidisciplinary with a lifelong desire and ability to weave disciplines and traditions together. Before leaving India, he studied economics as well as philosophy, including with Amartya Sen, and then philosophy and theology in German, Germany before going back, going to the UK and the US. He was both a scholar and a public intellectual. While scholars are often criticized for being too specialized, Joseph was a clear counterexample. He said both his work as a public intellectual and his scholarship in a global context centered around figures from several continents. Joseph worked tirelessly in and led organizations such as the Parliament for World Religions and the Society of Asian and Contemporary Philosophy. At his retirement from full-time teaching, Joseph established an interdisciplinary lecture series in our department focusing on peace and justice. Joseph, Joseph was an esteemed and valued member of our department, making wide and unique contributions to the range of courses we were able to offer our students and deep contributions to a departmental ethos of openness to and respect for global intellectual and spiritual traditions. He was irreplaceable. So our speakers today will be, uh, be Professor, our professors, Donald Williams and Jack Miles. And I'd like to uh, read brief introductions of both of them. Donald is the Leonard K. Firestone Professor of Religion at the University of Southern California and co-founder of the Center for Religion and Civic Culture at USC. He is the author, co-author, or editor of 11 books. His most recent book was based on 260 interviews with survivors of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. 
He's also written extensively on global pe Pentecostalism, new networks of Christian churches, and social issues such as homelessness. His current project is on the role of spirituality in the lives of individuals involved in heroic humanitarian activities. His research has allowed him to travel extensively in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, including numerous trips to the Republic of Armenia, the Middle East, and Rwanda. Jack is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of English and Religious Studies at the University of California, Irvine. He has written on religion, politics, and culture for the Atlantic, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the American Scholar, Commonweal, and many other publications. His book, God, a Biography, great title, by the way, um, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1996. The Norton Anthology of World Religions, of which he was a general editor, was published in 2014 in hardcover and in 2015 as a six volume paperback edition. MacArthur Fellow during the years 2003 to 2007, he's most recently the author of God and the Quran and Religion as We Know It, an origin story. I'm hanging up on them. So um, after Jack and Do Donald and Jack have presented their thoughts on Joseph's life and work, we'll open the floor to questions, comments, and discussion. So please use the um, raise hand feature. That's a, that's a little doohickey on the bottom of your screen. It's contained in the reactions pop-up. Um, that will, if you use that, that will um, automatically, or it should automatically order people in, in the or show people in the order in which their their hands were raised, um, and I will be moderating the discussion. Though uh, we're all grown ups here, so probably um, I will just be calling on people if we get into a, a, a free form discussion. I won't interfere. Um, and also, please be sure to have. A, I think most of you do have your name at the bottom of your screen. So if I'm calling on people, I know who I'm calling on. Um, and also for those of you who have come in um, be, uh, after we began, I want to uh, let you know that we are recording this uh, session. So we'll begin with Donald, who has prepared a video of Joseph speaking about his life and work, which he will introduce mm -hmm. with a few remarks, and then I will share my screen. Not everybody does. I haven't. Okay, uh, thank you, David. And I want to give just a little bit of context to what you will be hearing in a few minutes. And my history with Joseph goes back at least 30 years to All Saints Church, an Episcopal church in Pasadena. And uh, Tara and my daughter uh, were childhood friends. And um, I see Betty there. I want to acknowledge uh, Betty Bamberg also. But when it was clear that Joseph was um, terminal as a cancer um, patient, of course, I was stunned. He seemed too young. And I wondered how could I possibly respond to this in a way that might be useful and it occurred to me that uh, since I'd done a lot of interviewing, maybe I should take my tape recorder over and sit with Joseph and Betty, which I did, I think, on four different occasions for an hour or two each time. And those were really remarkable conversations in a number of ways. Uh, they spanned quite a few months, and at the beginning, Joseph was very lucid. As we went on in time, it was clear that uh, the cancer was affecting his memory, and uh, he sometimes struggled for words, and Betty was uh, usually very helpful in supplying the name of a place or even a philosopher. So, uh, it was actually at the memorial that I mentioned to Jack Miles that I had done these interviews. And my goal, frankly, was just to make them available to uh, Tara, to Betty, with the thought that maybe his two grandchildren at some point might want to hear the voice of Joseph. And of course, as you all know, he had quite a voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And um, so then the task was, well, what to do with all these hours in uh, 20 minutes? In fact, my first goal was just uh, 15 minutes. And so uh, I decided I would leave out his uh, reflections on Mother Teresa. Um, who scolded him once, I think, for falling asleep when he was a choir boy uh, and various other reflections and instead focus a bit on just his uh, intellectual biography, which of course meant starting with his childhood. And so uh, in order to sort of track this, I thought, well, maybe I should turn this into a video. And so you're gonna see some headings that will help locate different places. And then one of the uh, things that I struggled with was whether to include Joseph's reflections on death. But uh, one of the sessions, he said, I wanna talk about death, about my own death. And so uh, the short 20 minute audio that you're going to hear it ends very abruptly, actually, because I had no idea where to go from that, and my editing skills were not uh, good enough to make a, a sort of a graceful conclusion. So Jack Miles is going to jump in right at that point. And um, with that as a context, um, I want you to hear the, the voice of Joseph Pra Prabhu. Uh, uh, a rather luminous voice, I must say. So David, if you could um, run that, that would be great. Yep, and you will also see that in addition to his voice, uh, Joseph was a very handsome man, as you will see when I share this video, which I have to find. Where'd you go? There he is. Okay, here we go. My name is Joseph Prabhu. Uh, I was born in March 21st, 1946 in uh, Mangalore, India. And um, my father, who was a civil servant, got transferred to Calcutta, where I basically grew up and um, did all my school education. Um, and I feel that Calcutta, where uh, I was growing from the age of two till uh, 22, uh, really shaped my subsequent life. Um, and it did that because um, Calcutta was, uh, at that time, we're talking about the 1950s, um, early 1950s, all the way till I uh, went to college in Delhi in 1963, uh, was a very plural culture. Um, uh, in our own house, as I said, we had an Armenian family, uh, uh, a Jew who played the violin, and um, uh, it was quite common uh, even in my school, because of the plural culture, uh, to have people from many different traditions. And uh, the school uh, by the Jesuits, uh, while they were um, certainly Catholic uh, and uh, taught by Belgian Jesuits, um, did not impose their Christianity uh, on the people who did not consider themselves Christian. Uh, those who were interested were certainly welcome to come to our Christian education class where we'd have scripture and, and so on. But um, those who did not, and the majority did not, have something called moral education where they were basically taught values and so on and so forth. Uh, my parents were, well, my father, did mathematics. He had um, <clears throat> got an MA in mathematics and did sufficiently well uh, that uh, he was brought into the civil service. And uh, my mother 
uh, was the first woman graduate uh, in, she was born in 1914, uh, so she was the first Indian graduate uh, in uh, her uh, town. My mother's side of the family uh, were very wealthy um, and uh, came out of um, you know, own land in Mangalore and, and so up. And um, my father's side of the family came from uh, groups that were very, very poor. Well, there's a reason I landed up in economics, because uh, A, my mother was a very ambitious woman, and um, uh, saw me as um, being in the World Bank. And my career had been sort of, ah, if you want to get to the World Bank, you've got to go to the best college and study economics. Um, I was 16 then. And, you know, I was taught by good teachers, but um, there was much else going on there. Uh, that was far more exciting to me, um, acting and debating and um, the student movement and, and so on. So I was not a very good student because it, I, I, I was not applying myself to it. It, it just didn't uh, appeal to me. The teachers were lackluster. So there was plenty to do that um, kept me occupied. And uh, then... Uh, I, uh, you know, did did a did not get the best degree because I, I didn't study terribly hard, and uh, but was good enough to get to the other best institution, which is where Amartya Sen was teaching, um, called the Delhi School of Economics, which was the, I mean, he got one. Nobel Prize, and at least two others could have got a Nobel Prize. Um, uh, so I, I was very fortunate to uh, to get there, to, to the Delhi School of Economics. But Gandhi's grandson, R Ramu Gandhi, um, was in St. Stephen's. Uh, he had come back from Oxford and started a philosophy club, and I found that very interesting. Um, and so his subject was, he was teaching philosophy. I was in the Delhi School of Economics. Um, uh, but I would go to the philosophy club and, you know, join in the discussions and so on. Uh, so that, you know, got my interest in philosophy. And through the student movement, I got my interest in theology and, and religion. So uh, there was much else going on uh, that... Uh, didn't interest me particularly in in economics. And uh, so when I, because of my involvement with the student movement, was able to get a scholarship to go to Germany because they were looking at that time, you know, this was a student movement and the Catholic student movement. We're talking now about the 60s, uh, pre-Vatican, post-Vatican II, uh, looking to encourage young students. Uh, I got this very generous offer to go to anywhere in Europe uh, and I chose Germany and Sen, who was my professor then, was both stunned and uh, 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 really shocked by it because uh, he said, you don't know a word of German and uh, you're chucking, you know, you uh, the best in said it not in such crude terms, but uh, but again the Jesuits came out uh, to my rescue because my mother, who refused to talk to me, uh, she was so angry, um, uh, then went to a priest whom she greatly expected, uh, re respected and said, have you heard this nonsense about my son? And I knew him and he sort of pacified her. He, uh, he, he was the professor of Sanskrit and, uh, and taught at the university level. And he said, uh, give him a chance and so on. So uh, 
she was still furious, but at least getting that from her, from this priest, um, gave her some sort of consolation. Um, picked up German pretty quickly in, in two months. I lived in a German family that spoke not a word of English, so I was reading German uh, texts in the Bible and uh, criminal stories and so on, the easy stuff to get to. Uh, and um, uh, somehow, maybe because of Sanskrit, maybe because of um, uh, just the beauty of the language, uh, I picked it up pretty quickly. And, um, uh, and again, to my great luck, Habermas, uh, was in his German, uh, sorry, was in his English phase at that time and spoke uh, a little English, uh, quite a lot to, there were quite a number of American students there, English speaking. Uh, and I, uh, in a sense, was feel, felt m more at home. But Habermas uh, was, again, pitched at an extremely high level. Uh, and uh, I say one thing about German universities at that time, which have changed, because they were extremely elitist. Um, they were essentially meant for the um, the higher class uh, who had previously attended universities themselves barely 10% of the German population sort of went to, others went to other, you know, to trade universities and so on. Um, uh, and only universities were pitched at this high level. And that was true of Habermas as well. Um, so, but I did get more uh, from him um, because he and some of his English speaking students um, were covering lectures that I was able to follow. Uh, go to a place where English was spoken, uh, and I chose Cambridge. So um, uh, I spent then uh, a year and a half at Cambridge. They took um, me the six years that I had studied in India and the uh, year that I had studied at Heidelberg at sort of advanced level and allowed me straight to go to the uh, master's level. When I finished at Cambridge, uh, I said, England's not the place for me. It's such a racist and class conscious country. Uh, I, and, you know, e even in the best uh, colleges, I could see the you know, the class consciousness. Um, uh, e even though I didn't personally have, you know, any uh, adverse experiences, it, it was just rampant there. Um, and uh, the snobbishness of, you know, these upper boys and so on and so forth. So uh, I had a choice in 1973 of, of what to, because I got in Cambridge, uh, they gave me, because of my six years of education, they gave me, a, and I was entering philosophy for the very first time, uh, they allowed me a chance to do the equivalent of a master, so that I didn't have to go through, you know, from scratch. Uh, they were giving me that credit. Uh, so when I finished my master's there, I had a choice of staying on there to finish a PhD, because I knew that I wanted to f finish a PhD. Uh, I could go to Germany, where, which I was much more interested in, or, or come here. And the reason, I, I thought about that quite hard. Uh, uh, and I said, from, you know, I, I didn't have any sort of first-hand experience. But, but in, um, in Germany, I encountered a, a few English, sorry, a few um, American students who had come there to start study with Habermas. And um, I got to talk to them quite a bit and, uh, you know, was curious about what this country was like. Uh, and uh, just felt that, uh, from the little that I knew, that this was a plural culture, that, that uh, 
that unlike Germany and unlike England, uh, there were many cultures here and, and so on, and that uh, the United States was most like India. And uh, that's where I chose to, to come here, that, that I said. Uh, uh, cut a long story short, um, I, my first job uh, was at the University of New Hampshire, which was close enough. Uh, and um, I would spend uh, Tuesdays through uh, Thursday um, teaching there. Uh, and it only took uh, 60 miles. Uh, and then was able to come back to Boston to be with Tara and uh, Diane. Uh, and But then... Uh, that worked out well because I could spend time with Tara and spend at least uh, three months or three and a half months, uh, days rather, with, with her and Diane. Uh, but then I, my one year appointment at uh, uh, B, uh, uh, Hampshire died, uh, ended up and uh, I looked for um, a more sort of permanent place and two choices one was to go to Northwestern uh, and uh, the other was BU and Northwestern said look this is a strictly th three year fellowship and uh, BU is offering me tenure my, my views are what I'd call a reflective equilibrium because they have three components to them which interact with each other. Uh, one is knowledge, uh, the fact that I know and everyone knows that biologically uh, we're going to die and uh, life is finite uh, and what we make of it, uh, of our finitude, is um, obviously an existential question. So there are certain knowledge components uh, which uh, are factual. Uh, then there is belief. Uh, I am a Christian uh, and uh, obviously as a Christian I was taught certain beliefs uh, which have evolved. Uh, I can't make much sense of the final judgment um, uh, uh, and that's dropped. Um, uh, I don't know what it is. I have no sense of... Uh, I, I can make sense of it, uh, but it has no resonance in me. So as you ask for personal, uh, it has no sort of personal resonance. Uh, and uh, with that also, as you talk about Becker, uh, I, I don't particularly fear death. Uh, on the contrary, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, and, uh, you know, while I hanker after <laughs> dying, I'm certainly uh, not uh, frightened by it. So certain beliefs have fallen by the by the wayside. Um, uh, what exactly happens after our biological death, uh, I don't know. Uh, I have certain beliefs which seem more plausible than others. Uh, I am less plausible about reincarnation, uh, though. I open it as a possibility, um, but again, it doesn't have any particular resonance in it. Uh, some form of reincarnation uh, where uh, another form of life beyond physical death uh, might continue, uh, and that to me seems very plausible. Uh, one reason why it's plausible is that so many people who have died continue to live on in me and uh, so their death uh, has not simply vanished um, and therefore um, uh, I 
firmly believe that uh, when I die, uh, I hope there will be some people who uh, think about me, on whom I've made an impact uh, in one way or the other. Uh, And the other thing that I I disagree with um, uh, Becker is that uh, I have a less individualistic point of view. I mean, death is not just for me. Uh, Death is for a whole society and perhaps even for the the universe. Uh, That I have sort of less... uh, knowledge about, but but certainly society, um, the people who have affected me, my my grandmother, my parents, etc., um, Bill Lesher, pe- people who are very close friends, live on in me. And, and so that belief I have. But then there's, there's also a practice um, that I've maintained for 35 or 40 years, a meditation where in meditation you try consciously to let go of your sort of normal knowledge patterns and so on and open yourself to the unknown. Uh, And so uh, I I am actually, through this practice, uh, fairly serene about uh, the fact that I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I have beliefs that uh, it'll be a good death, but I don't know for sure. Uh, but that gets into dying, because the the actual physical death um, is something that I have prepared for existentially through meditation for, for a very long time. And uh, so... Um, I, I, I'm not scared of death. I mean, ob- obviously, it happened uh, physical death. It, it happened uh, quite often, uh, and as I say, I did the usual things of writing my will and so on. But um, uh, I don't have those beliefs of going to hell or, or whatever it is. Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, at the moment, <laughs> I'm not particularly scared. as promised, an an abrupt ending. But uh, thank you, Don, for for putting that together. It was it was really wonderful. And um, yes, and I think, uh, shall we pass things on to to Jack at this point? Very well. Yes, we we all experience uh, that that abruptness, don't we? Uh, That uh, interruption. But death even a long foreseen and lovingly managed death arrives when it finally does arrive as an interruption. And even those who think they are ready for it discover then that they are not quite ready after all. The words we have just heard, Joseph Prabhu's reflective comments on his remarkable life story and his serene and inspiring comments on his impending death, Where do they leave us? They leave us, well, they leave us missing him, wishing we could look forward to the sound of his beautiful voice speaking to us once again. I think of Tennyson's famous lines after the death of a beloved friend, and the stately ships go on to their haven under the hill, but oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. I myself have a special reason for missing Joseph. Today's memorial was not initially intended to be a memorial at all. It was initially to be Joseph conversing with me as the general editor of the Norton Anthology of World Religions, telling me what he thought was amiss in our conception of that large subject and waiting for my rebuttal. A friendly debate, of course, but a real debate nonetheless. Though he and I had had a few conversations about this planned public conversation, I know that he was still working out what he wanted to say 
when the sudden worsening of his cancer intervened. And so, no, I will never know what he would have said, how he would have challenged me, though I can speculate, and I do. Today, speaking in honor of Joseph Prabhu, rather than as I had hoped, speaking with him, I would like to begin uh, with a little exercise in connecting geographical dots. Bear with me, I think we can have a little fun with this exercise, which is partly a review of what you have already heard. The first dot on the map is Calcutta, the city in Northeast uh, India that, as you just heard from Joseph's own lips, shaped him for life shaped him more than any other place ever would, and did so in one regard most especially, namely, in giving early birth to his profound, entirely unforced and lifelong appreciation of human diversity in all its color and all its complication. Remember that in Calcutta, he was not particularly diligent as a college student, Economics was the major his mother had chosen for him, a major leading in her long-range view to employment at the World Bank. But economics never captured his imagination. What did capture his imagination in Calcutta was Calcutta itself. And this should not surprise us, for Calcutta was surely during his undergraduate years the most culturally and politically exciting city in all of India, and India only then, just liberated from yeah. British colonial rule and bursting with new energy. The second dot, well, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but the second major dot is Cambridge, England. But remember that by the time when Joseph completed his master's degree in that fabled center of English learning, he had already done serious intellectual work in economics back in New Delhi under Nobel laureate Amartya Sen. He had already kindled his uh, early interest in philosophy thanks to the philosophy club chaired by Gandhi's son. And then he had done equally serious work in Germany in philosophy under the world famous philosopher Jürgen Habermas. Yet his next step, he had decided there in Cambridge, would be a doctorate in theology. And he had faced the question, would he do it there in England? Would he head back to Germany, whose language he loved and had quickly mastered? In fact, as we know, he chose the USA, where he had never studied at all. And why? because the diversity that he knew existed here and the manner of the Americans he had met both in Germany and in England made him think that more than either England or Germany, America would be like hmm, Calcutta. Yes, Calcutta. The diversity of America called to him in his young manhood as the diversity of Calcutta had called to him in his boyhood. We don't think, we Americans, that Calcutta is much like any of our American cities, whatever their internal diversity. But Joseph Prabhu was a man who could see linkages and build bridges spiritually and intellectually that those whose education was less global than his could scarcely even dream of. But to review the mental map that you have been drawing, you have gone from the first dot, Calcutta, by train, somewhat west to New Delhi, then by mental airplane north, northwest, all the way to Marburg and Heidelberg in Germany, then by train again and by ferry across the English Channel to Cambridge, England, and finally by flying saucer across the Atlantic Pond to Boston University, where Joseph did his doctorate in theology. What a trip. Calcutta, Marburg, Heidelberg, Cambridge, Boston. It took Joseph half a lifetime to cover the territory you have covered in 10 minutes. You must be suffering truly serious jet lag. So relax. I have scheduled a rest stop for you here in Boston. 
And while you rest up here, let me tell you about Joseph Prabhu's very last published work, an article posthumously published this past summer in an anthology edited by Rita D. Sherma and entitled Religion and Sustainability, Interreligious Resources, Interdisciplinary Responses. Joseph's contribution as a philosopher to that volume published by Springer, a prominent Swiss publisher of serious academic work, appears as chapter two, The Conditions of Hospitality in Interreligious Encounter. Though I will have a good deal to say about this article a bit later, let me first underscore something that should surprise few gathered here today. Namely, that as we confront the terrifying world climate crisis, political leaders <clears throat> and prominent client, climate scientists alike do not, as a rule, think that religion has any real role to play at all. Such indeed is the rule, but there are a few striking exceptions, and to follow the story of one of these exceptions, you must sign on to mental Zoom while I take you all the way back from Boston to a tiny village in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, where a boy was born, a very near contemporary of Joseph Prabhu, who would grow up to be the eminent atmospheric scientist, the Rabat Hadran Ramatan, known as Ram Ramanathan to his friends. Ram Ramanathan would achieve early fame for truly groundbreaking scientific discoveries about how commercial pollutants were destroying the world's indispensable ozone layer. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the wake of that brilliant work, he would become director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography just down the I-5 in La Jolla, where the Scripps Institution is now part of the University of California, San Diego. So we're back in Southern California now, but not quite yet all the way back to Cal State Los Angeles, where we will end up. In late 2014, as the crucially important 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference lay ahead, two world leaders turned to Ram Ramanathan for help. One was Governor Jerry Brown, who tasked Janet Napolitano, then president of the UC, with producing a document offering scalable solutions to the climate crisis. President Napolitano turned immediately to Professor Ramanathan and Ram rallied his colleagues across the UC system, mostly in the obviously relevant natural sciences, but also in social science and the humanities. Together, on a crash schedule, some 50 faculty produced a far-ranging document entitled Bending the Curve, which Governor Brown took with him to Paris and which has since generated a video course study program being used far beyond the originating university. So then, Jerry Brown was the first world leader to turn to Ram Ramanathan in 2014-2015. And who was the second? The second was Pope Francis, whose Pontifical Academy of Science had turned to Ramanathan, a Hindu, and to another eminent Indian scientist for help in preparing the Pope's unprecedented climate change encyclical, Laudato Si. Bending the Curve and Laudato Si both appeared in 2015, both deliberately targeted on the conference that produced the landmark agreement, later repudiated by former President Donald J. Trump as a Chinese hoax in a press conference televised from the Rose Garden, but still later, unrepudiated by President Joseph R. Biden. Now, hello. Joseph Prabhu and Ram Ramanathan never met, but it had been my hope to introduce them, for Ramanathan came away from his Vatican experience deeply persuaded that the world climate crisis cannot be met without somehow turning that crisis 
into the occasion for something like a world religious conversion. Political leadership has proven itself quite unequal to meeting this crisis. For political leaders, explicitly in democracies and implicitly even in autocracies, are all followers. They must all follow those who elected them in the last election, lest they be, de be defeated in the next election, or lest in autocracies, they be overthrown and perhaps shot in the next coup d'etat. Mass religious movements, by contrast, are rare, but when they occur, they are popular movements surging irresistibly from the bottom up, and as such, they can have historic, world-changing consequences. Religious leaders and religious thinkers, therefore, must not be ignored or ruled out in advance. For Ramanathan, they are indispensable if the worst consequences of climate destruction are to be avoided. Around now, I sense an objection already forming in your minds. How are the religions of the world, riven as they are by mutual sectarian pride and reciprocal, sometimes violent contempt, ever going to come together to make common cause in facing a catastrophe that could place the entire human race on an accelerating road to extinction. This is the challenge that the anthology, Religion and Sustainability, aims to address. And within the anthology, Joseph Prabhu's task was to offer a new way for venerable religious traditions to set age-old antagonisms aside and come together in peace and common purpose. Joseph himself lived and died as a Roman Catholic. Professor Miller and I both attended his funeral in Holy Family Catholic Church in South Pasadena, and it was after that service that we conceived today's two-part memorial event. And yet privately, Joseph had insisted to me that his Roman Catholicism was actually a Hindu rather than a truly Roman Catholicism. His was a kind of Catholicism different, Joseph claimed, from other varieties of that tradition on offer around the world. And Hinduism was the key to the difference. How many varieties of such flavored Catholicism, so to call them, existed in his mind, I do not know. Our conversation never got that far. But from just this much, we can perhaps begin to see where he was headed. Can one belong to two religions authentically at the same time? The Jew who attends my Episcopal church in Santa Ana also attends a synagogue. A great now deceased Christian scholar of Hinduism, as I recently learned from his widow, ordered that his ashes were to be divided. Most were interred in the columbarium at the rear of the Presbyterian church he attended. But some, very carefully packaged, have now been scattered in the Ganges in the classic Hindu manner. Once you begin to look for it, you find religious syncretism in surprising corners, coming into being by surprising paths. A colleague of mine at the University of California, Irvine, wrote an entire short monograph on the surprising frequency of interreligious marriage between Punjabi Sikhs and Chicano Catholics. In Joseph's essay, The Conditions of Hospitality and Interreligious Encounter, he never asks or answers the question, who is the host and who the guest in such encounters? The reason for this omission is, I think, that for him, such encounter is the equivalent of a no-host bar. That is a bar where all are simultaneously hosts and guests, all equal, but all, so to speak, on their polite best behavior, like a good guest. As for the conditions for success in such an encounter, Joseph openly borrows from a now deceased scholar whom he revered as a mentor, namely Raimundo Panikar, the son of a Spanish Catholic mother and an Indian Hindu father, who remained to the end of his life 
the authentic heir of both his mother's and his father's faith. Raimondo Panikar regarded interreligious encounter as in itself an inherently religious experience, though by no means an easy experience. In fact, as Joseph presents it after Panikar, Interreligious encounter requires of those engaging in this spiritual exercise at full strength, kind of severe and courageous ascetic discipline. Why do I say this? Because Panikar and Prabhu agree, using a term from Christian spirituality, that this exercise calls for kenosis. Kenosis, a Greek term meaning emptiness or emptying is employed by St. Paul to characterize what Christ experienced as he died on the cross to wipe away all sin and bring God and humankind together in a final glorious reconciliation. To do this, however, Christ had to lose more than just his life. Before he drew his last breath, he had to experience the loss of everything he had to lose, spiritual as well as physical an utter and total emptying. What has that experience to do with mere interreligious encounter? Citing Panikar, Joseph Prabhu says that to understand another, you must stand under that man or woman. You must humble yourself, not just to stand in another's shoes, but also to see the world, including yourself, truly as the other person sees it and you. And to do this, you must believe finally that nothing matters more than truth. You must be prepared to change in ways that you cannot know in advance. You must be prepared for loss as well as gain, and for perhaps major changes in your understanding of your place within your own religious or ph philosophical tradition, finally, you cannot know at the limit whether the encounter will or will not lead to your conversion to the other's religion or worldview, even if somehow you remain within your own community. Doing all this, risking all this, calls for a kind of spiritual daring that few will care to attempt and fewer still will fully achieve. Joseph admits as much. He admits that most of us are content to remain both as we are and where we are with whatever form or degree of religious practice or neglect we accept as ours. He admits that drift and inertia as the easy path are also the default path, but he does not stop there. He comments at one point in his article that According to census data, 183 religions are practiced in Los Angeles. He insists that when a great metropolis crosses from religious homogeneity or near homogeneity to religious heterogeneity as extensive as ours, well, at that point, a task once left to the exceptional or eccentric few begins to become a pragmatic duty for the many. Like it or not, religious encounter of some sort becomes a part of everyday social life. Joseph explicitly rejects as unhelpful an image that some of you may have come across, namely that of different religions as different paths up a single great mountain where in the end all will meet at the top. Joseph imagines instead some paths leading up one mountain, others up another. What they have in common, however, is that, and I quote, in their different ways, they lead practitioners from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness, and thus move us beyond the selfishness, greed, and lack of compassion that are part of the unredeemed human condition. And what is it, my friends? if not the unredeemed human condition that continues to prevent the peoples of the world from rallying to snatch victory from the jaws of a greater defeat through climate collapse than any defeat, any conceivable loss 
among, among the many that preoccupy them day by day. What would life be like on this planet if we all began to regard our fellow humans as our honored guests instead of our eat or be eaten global competitors? G.K. Chesterton once famously said, Christianity has not failed. Christianity has never been tried. As much could be said, I think, by an apologist or any of the other great religious uh, world traditions. But at this juncture in our shared history as a human species, a history shared physically now as never before with such intensity, the same can be said by those prophets who, like Joseph Prabhu, commit themselves to a lifelong attempt to offer hospitality to the earnest practitioners of other religions than their own. I will end these few remarks with the final paragraph in what may prove to be Joseph Prabhu's last published work. Joseph wrote, one is and should be hospitable for its own sake. It is an individual blessing and a social grace much needed in our time. One of the expressions of hospitality is interreligious encounter, some of whose challenges and benefits I have attempted to sketch in this essay. The hope is also that interreligious encounter might move us beyond the rather tribal sense of religion that has prevailed for long parts of human history, a sense of belonging to an exclusive club or sect. While this tribal sense of religion undoubtedly provides a sense of identity and belonging, and therefore it is by no means to be taken lightly, it often tends to be exclusionary. The vision of religion underlying interreligious encounter, as I have described it here, is by contrast very much a collective and shared vision. The hope is that this shared vision of religion, less tribal and more universal in nature, may serve us as spiritual basis for interreligious hospitality. We are fellow travelers caught up in a common human and cosmic adventure. I love the line attributed perhaps correctly to Edmund Burke. No one ever made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could do only a little. Let me close then with that simple line and that bold hope. For the written works Joseph Prabhu has left us, and for the inspiring human example he set for us, we honor him. If we manage to do even a little of the work he would be doing if he were still with us, we will honor him as he would most wish to be honored. And there ends the remarks that I had prepared for today, but now I must share with you a little surprise. Last night I had a dream about Joseph Prabhu. I have never been in India. I don't expect that I ever will be. But in this dream, I find myself in a large market, not exactly open air. It has no walls, but it does have a roof, quite large. Some good, and it has no paved floor, dirt floor. Some goods are offered in open sacks. There are some shelves that have conventional bottles and cans on them. And uh, Joseph is there. He is working. He is positioned as a cashier. Now, there are no customers uh, down his aisle, but he sits there quite, quite happily. And around him, there are three or four, maybe five young boys. They're, they're playing around. Are they his grandchildren? Are they related to him in some way? Maybe not. I think they seem look seem more like you know neighborhood boys who uh, just like to hang out in the market. And and Joseph is a fixture there at his cashier, so they know him well. And every so often he steps in and he you know says, "No, that's not yours. Now put it back on the shelf." Or you know some little remark like that. Now I am sort of off to the side in the shelf area. He doesn't see me, and I happen to be holding. A, a laptop computer. So at a certain point, I come out and I, I go over to him and offer him my laptop computer. Wouldn't this be more fun than your cash register? No, he, he, he doesn't take the laptop computer, but he does shut down the cash register and he gets up and he sings a song. He sings a song and he moves about in a kind of 
a, a, a kind of stylized walking way. It's a, it's a very kind of Indian cinematic moment, you know, where people burst into song when you least expect it, you know. And he does some things. He doesn't, you know, do formal mudras. Nothing very, you know, elaborately Hindu. But he does a few things with his hand. And then I woke up. And so then, so I I thought of this. Uh, you know, you can interpret that. I I, be, I can't begin to interpret it. But uh, I offer it uh, to you, and I offer it also in, just in case this is being recorded and it finds its way to any of his extended family uh, in India. I think that that might have been his message through me to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Don. Let's thank our speakers. Okay, well, now we, we're having a Q&A open discussion. Uh, please use the, the hand raised gizmo in reactions. Um, I'm going to start us off, but if the if the conversation goes in a certain direction, I will. Um, people stop raising their hands and just start talking. That's fine. Anybody, would anybody like to share any reminiscences about, about Joseph? Or Betty, would you like to say some words? Uh-oh, put you on the spot. You're muted. Betty, un you're muted. There we are. Yes. Um, it was lovely of Jack and uh, Don to put together this presentation. It's certain certainly brought back a lot of memories. And um, uh, I made many trips to India with Joseph. <laughs> I never dreamed that my uh, later life, I would tour all of India, but I pretty much went everywhere except the far Northeast. Um, and uh, it's an amazing country. And uh, it always stayed with him. Uh, Ruth. Hello, greetings to everybody, to Tara, Betty, all family and friends of Joseph. Um, uh, Jack, before I share some of my reminiscences, Jack, I think <clears throat> that the market you were talking about was about human currency, and that's why he was the cashier. <laughs> so he didn't need your laptop. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> but what a delightful dream to have, especially before you're giving your lecture. Um, I remember so many moments with Joseph. Uh, Joseph and I were among the co-founders of the Southern California Parliament of the World's Religions. And then we were co-chairs together for 10 years. And that was a true meeting of East and West and also very different leadership styles. And male and female and Jewish and Christian. And so he really did live out what his personal philosophy was in, in the way uh, he associated with all of us in the interfaith community. Um, I remember um, especially before Joseph went to have his first surgery, I went to visit him with my daughter and in the garden and um, we had a personal joke that I always used to call him Lord Lord because his last day problem means Lord. And also he's, he still had some leftover uh, <laughs> traits of maybe it was his English accent or I don't know what to say, but he, but he uh, we used to tease him about being very Lord-like and um, when he, he brought a chair for my daughter, I remember he wasn't feeling well, but he was ever the gentleman. And he brought a chair and um, we sat down and he said, he looked at me and he said, uh, Lord Prabhu is no more. Uh -huh. And I waited for him to explain that. And he said that he had been doing a lot of meditation 
and he felt his personality dissolving. And um, he felt like he was moving into a new phase of his life. And at that point, it wasn't that he thought he was going to die, but there was something kind of mystical and beyond where Joseph, the paths that Joseph had tread in his own personal life as a professor and, and a, a philosopher. But there was something new, new about him at that moment that I, I noticed. And also that when he said that, he said, but I'm perfectly at ease. He didn't mind that Lord Prabhu was no more and that his personality had somehow dropped, fell away from him, that he felt he was left with the essence of who he was as a human being. And uh, I'd like to say something. And uh, that's all I'm going to say for now, but my friend Doris Davis, who is with, with me, is, would like to say something too. <laughs> Uh, Jack, I was uh, struck by one word you used, and I'd like you to elaborate as to why you chose it. You used the word prophet. Yeah. Uh, when you used that word with Joseph, what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. I was uh, thinking... Uh, of the two aspects that uh, combine for me in biblical prophecy. There is an element of foretelling. In the, the, you might say the, the, the common preacher's comment is uh, that prophecy is more forthtelling than foretelling. There is also an element of foretelling. There, there is an attention uh, to fearful developments in the future that that ordinary people uh, do not wish to hear and that in particular ruling people do not wish to hear or attend to. So the, the prophet uh, rebukes uh, the king, he rebukes the leadership of uh, the people and he warns of danger uh, to come. But uh, the message to the ordinary person hearing uh, the words of a prophet is to repent. It, you know, it is not, not simply to despair, it is to repent and uh, change your ways. And then uh, the evil that God uh, has threatened to inflict upon the people for their sins uh, can be averted. Those, those would be the elements that, uh, that I had in mind. But, but while I'm here, I, I want to ask a little question of Tara and Betty. Did Joseph sing? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. When I was growing up, uh, you know, it was it was a house filled with music, a, a lot of um, Peter, Paul and Mary, and Paul Simon. I see. Um, but he loved to cook and sing. Um, I didn't know that, but it, it, oh, it, it was in my loved, dream anyway. <laughs> he also loved in church. I mean, I grew up going with him, as, as Don said, to All Saints, uh, really all my life. And um, he really loved to sing in church and I was typically mortified by that because he want, it seemed like he wanted to be the you know loudest person in the church really <laughs> singing with like all the gusto he could muster um, and at the holidays you know if he could sing any Christmas carol either in German or Latin you know, <laughs> that, that switch was was gratifying to him too. Well, it's a dad's job to mortify his children. That's right. <laughs> he did. Especially he when did they're teenagers. That. <laughs> okay, shall we move on to the next? So Andre or Deborah? Not sure whose hand was raised. Um, I, I was very uh, privileged to have an encounter with Joseph a few weeks before he died. And uh home the some of his reminiscences and some of his thoughts. And um, I was very, very... We can't hear you, Andre. It's very hard to hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I shared uh, a moment with uh, Joseph a couple of weeks before he died. And um, it was quite beautiful. Uh, I sensed his deep calm, his peace at the possibility of um, dying or the certainty of dying. But at the same time, uh, I was reminded of something he told me quite a few years earlier about what he wanted inscribed on his uh, tomb, uh, which was the, which were the words Sat Chit Ananda, uh, the three names of the Godhead, perhaps. And um, I just did, I just loved his mind. Um, his mind was universal in its capacity. And at the same time, symphonic in its ability to interweave so many disparate elements into one gorgeous, unexpected harmony. Um, so being a companion of his for about 10 years, uh, in the interfaith work, um, I marveled uh, at, at who he was and who he is. So I just wanted to honor Joseph by sharing a few words of poetry, especially liked uh, one of my poems um, called Emptiness. Um, and it goes something like uh, this. Um, Emptiness is being empty. No fullness can compare with this emptiness. O oh, fullness, O oh, emptiness. Um, I can't remember the rest, but be that as it may, um, I just wanted to end with a short few phrases I wrote recently, which make me think of him very much. O creature, know thyself beyond the tongues of all created things. Fall in astonishment at the beauty of your unguarded self. Bless the holy earth you stand on simply by the gift of your presence. Thank you. Thank you. I just would like to add a few words. Andre has spoken of the beauty of, of Joseph's mind. We shared a lot with poetry and prayer together. But what I really want to honor here is just how caring and loving he was, that the interest that he took in our lives and in our children's lives. And I, I can remember when he was very, very ill. Um, he, I was on a road trip with my son. We're at the moment in Boston, uh, visiting our, grand, our grandson, our one-year-old baby, um, grandbaby. <laughs> we don't have a one-year-old baby. <coughs> Excuse me. And he just called, we'd had a very serious car accident on the way here. And I can just remember him calling us while with my son while we were driving after the accident, we had to rent a car. And just, just he could hardly, hardly speak or breathe, get the words out. And of course his memory was kind of looping in and out. And yet he just took that, that effort mm. to just call to see how we were. And it just, I, I miss him so much, so much. Just the deep friendship and just how, how extraordinary it is and what an opportunity we had to create so many events together. Um, I know Ruth and we have other members from the parliament here. Just, just, just what an honor. And just to give you a little taste, you know, at, at how unconventional Joseph could also be, we would have our, our retreats 
at uh, Jeff Utter's home. I hope Jeff's on the call still. And um, the one year that we had our retreat was actually, he had heard about his diagnosis maybe a week before the retreat. And so him and I were actually co-facilitating that retreat and we decided not to mention to the group about his illness till the very end. He did not want the retreat to be about him. Obviously, if we'd mentioned it up front, it would have been about him. He didn't want that. And at the very end of the retreat, we did a healing circle with him. It was so powerful, so potent. I mean, everybody was in tears. Of course, Joseph as well. And that first cycle that he had, uh, when he first had his surgery, I mean, it was extraordinary. And he always referenced that. And then following that time, that first surgery, we would get together every single morning at 8 a.m. And we did that Monday to Friday without fail for 18 months. And we started as, off as quite a group and that dwindled after the months went by until it was just Andre, Joseph and myself. And it was incredible. I mean, it, it morphed into him bringing a teaching every day of some kind, somebody that he loved and, and um, it was just extraordinary. Yes. Sending you so much love. Just Betty and Tara, just to take this chance, I, I did send you those videos. I don't know if you saw them that Andre took of Joseph towards the end. I hope you saw them. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Love to you all. Thank you. Anybody else? Henry, do you have any reminiscences you'd like to share? If you're there. He may not be here anymore. He's stepped away for the moment. Sorry, I'm not very good at unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> no, with Joseph, it was always things which we wanted to do but didn't do. Uh, Joseph would say, let's do a seminar on uh, the parting of the ways, was one of his favorites on how uh, analytic philosophy and, and continental philosophy sort of came into existence. That was one of his great desires, and he thought we would do a great seminar on that. And I was game for it, but I always thought, gosh, that would be a lot of work. <laughs> So I kept putting it off. And the problem with when you put things off is that they just get put off. And so that's my main <coughs> thoughts about Joseph is, is all the missed opportunities. And, and that causes regret. Sorry. Um, OK, Doug. On mute. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks uh, for arranging this. And uh, I, I found it really informative and very moving to listen to the presentations and the comments, including from uh, people who were such a part of Joseph's life. And I didn't know most of you although uh, Joseph was such a part of my life. So I'll just share a little. I, uh, well, I became a professor at the University of Maine in 1974. So I think that was one year after Joseph came to the United States. And then over the decades, we were very close, uh, partly uh, because of our scholarly interest and collaboration. Um, also, uh, be, uh, because uh, we had many similar values in terms of our commitments, how we lived our lives and our concerns for peace and justice, sustainability, uh, uh, and so forth. And also in a very deep personal way, we connected. So I'll just share a little bit. Um, the uh, I recall uh, 
for example, uh, I recall, for example, coming to Pasadena, number of times staying at Joseph's house. I think the first time may have been, I think Tara may have been a student at UCLA, I think maybe at that time. Uh, but uh, I remember how proud Joseph was of Tara and later, of course, uh, all kinds of happy occasions, um, and including some in Maine and, uh, and also the, um, and Joseph came here. Uh, I had him, not only did I speak in California and so forth and to him, but I had him come as a kind of distinguished philosophy scholar at the University of Maine. And then later, of course, Betty came with uh, Joseph to Maine and uh, stayed with us. And we had many wonderful experiences. I'll just share a little bit. Um, in terms of India, I, I've been to India a lot. In fact, I've probably lived in India for at least five years. And just like Betty said, I've seen much more of India than the United States. And it was so formative. Uh, but among other things, at one point, uh, in, uh, at this point in Bangalore, I actually got to know Joseph's mother very well. <laughs> and I think, you know, I could, I think she was 90 or just about 90. I remember when she uh, celebrated 90 in years. And you know, at 90, she was a force. She had a strong will. Uh, oh, so yeah. I certainly could relate to, and, and Joseph's other family, I got to meet in India as well. And the um, uh, a couple of things that people mentioned that I thought were was really a remarkable strength of uh, Joseph. Uh, and uh, some uh, was mentioned about Ramu, Ramu Gandhi, and uh, who I knew, and Joseph knew, of course, very, very well. And uh, this was one of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's grandsons who was brilliant. Uh, he was charismatic, a great writer, a great speaker, and his life was really tragic. And in fact, he wound up, I used to see him in New Delhi, he wound up as a homeless person. Mm. And he had all kinds of demons. And what was interesting when he died, and he died tragically, uh, Joseph really um, spoke and wrote beautifully, beautifully about Ramu's legacy. I mean, it was really quite incredible how he honored his friend and his legacy, uh, and what and being grateful for what we could learn from Ramu. And the other one who was mentioned suddenly was uh, Panakar. Well, so Panikar was so interesting, it was Indian, had the, also like Joseph had the Christian, had the Hindu. And of course, Panikar wound up again in California. That's where he was a professor at Santa Barbara for decades. And, uh, and Joseph so beautifully honored Panikar, you know, in, in, in talks and in lectures and writings passing on so Panakar could live in us and in uh, the future. So I think that was a remarkable strength that Joseph had. And I'm, I'm really glad that I think people honored that in Joseph tonight with this gathering. The, uh, I'll just end by saying one thing. I, I don't know if anyone will think this is funny. Joseph, of course, as I said, had the striking looks. He had the striking voice, the accent, the deep. Uh, Joseph also had a great sense of humor. Amen. And he could laugh really loudly. <laughs> uh, and so uh, this related to the story that was told the dream at the end, it occurred to me. So I don't know if anyone else will think it's funny, but Joseph thought it was hilarious. Uh, Joseph, of course, grew up in Calcutta, which is so formative. And uh, I spent a lot of time there. We had a full sabbatical in Calcutta. And uh, so one day, uh, I don't know if you, you've all heard of or know about Horlicks, the drink. 
You know, Horlicks, you can get it in the United States. It's very popular in England and it was part of the colonial legacy. So it was all over in Calcutta, all over uh, um, in India. And Horlicks is this kind of, kind of like malted, usually you get chocolate, it's like a powder. It's supposed to be super nutritious and you take it with milk and you can heat it up and it's supposed to have, all, it has all these vitamins. It's supposed to be very beneficial. So here I'm, we're in Calcutta and uh, I was drinking Horlicks and it reminded me of the story at the end about out in the market, the dream you had, the yeah. dream at the end. Because I go out there in the market and there's a little merchant, small with the shelves. And I say to him, you know, uh, I'd like, you know, a container of Horlicks. And the guy says to me, we don't have Horlicks. I said, you don't have Horlicks? He says, no, he keeps telling me he doesn't have Horlicks. And then I look up on the top of the shelf and there's Horlicks. So I pointed to it and I said, look, you have Horlicks. And in this strong Bengali, very strong Bengali accent, the guy says, oh, you mean Horlicks. <laughs> <laughs> Horlicks. Horlicks, my Indian English, he didn't recognize. But when I pointed, oh, you mean, well, Joseph thought this was hilarious. I would say at least 50 times he raised that with me. And each time he would say, oh, drink your Horlicks. And then he <laughs> would burst into laughter. And uh, again, it was just this very endearing way that... Uh, that we related. Mm. So anyway, I'll, I'll just stop with that, but I wanna thank you for organizing the gathering and for sharing so many meaningful things. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to say something or ask, ask our speakers a question, getting it to get into a theological debate? <laughs> I just I wanted to add one thing that uh, Joseph studied with Gershom Scholem well. he was in Germany and that was very meaningful to Gershom Scholem was considered he's no longer with us the world expert on the Kabbalah right. and uh, and about a lot of the stories from Jewish mysticism even though he himself was not a, a religious man or, or <clears throat> part of any religious community actively, he was Jewish, of course, but, uh, but uh, Joseph also had an association with, I think it was Yehudi Menuchen, and in, um, when he was in San Francisco, he knew quite a number of, of uh, celebrities, you know, whatever they, what field they were in, music or philosophy, and he knew them well. And um, that was, I guess, one of his sorrows that he, he wanted to write about those things, not just about his, how he became a philosopher and, and the people that he venerated in philosophy, but he wanted to write about the everyday people that he knew on his journey. And, and he was frustrated about that at the end that he couldn't get to write all those things. So maybe a Jack, Miles can dream about that and tell us what he was going to say. <laughs> well, I had conversations with him um, as his energy was draining away, and I knew he had this ambition uh, to tell his story. But as you heard him talking about it, as Ruth says, it was very person-centered. And uh, so I asked him, I suggested to him, and he liked the idea that rather than attempting to tell a, a continuous story, he simply uh, pen uh, quick vignettes, you know, moments of encounter with with the, the people who loomed largest in his memory. Right. It was a, pro a promising path, but but even that, uh, the time proved too short to attempt. David, Jack, oh, one more thing, Jack. Oh, James. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about the professor from Boston who he stayed in touch with 
And then one of his classmates was also very close to their professor. I can't remember his name, but his classmate called him and said, and told about the last time that professor spoke to his class. It was such a, along the lines of, um, of Joseph speaking about death that the professor uh, had the regular class with his students. And then at the end, he closed his book and he said to the students, um, I just wanna ask each of you, to say something about your life, where you are and what you believe in. And one by one, they went around the classroom and each one spoke. And then he stood up and he said, thank you so much, class is over. And he gathered his materials, his books, put them in his briefcase, went home, put the briefcase in his uh, dining room and went to his bed and died but that the very last thing he did was not to teach anything from his books, but to ask his students about what they thought about their own lives. And that story was so meaningful to Joseph. I believe he even wrote about it in something that he was planning to include. Do you remember that story, Jack? Uh, yes, I think it stood for uh, the notion that we are always learners, that the teachers must be learners, you know? So that story spoke to him because on his, at his last class, that teacher was learning from his students. And also I think that had a premonition that it was his last class without, yes. without yes. stating it specifically. And that, and in the end, it was about his concern for others rather than the transmission of knowledge mm -hmm. that hallmarked that particular class. Mm -hmm. Meaning you don't get it in the books you know, what you get it in is in a person's lived life and experience. And he wanted to honor his students for that. David. I just wanted to say a few things. Um, first of all, to thank Jack for something that I'd never thought of. That is that facing this climate crisis, the fate of the earth is going to take something like a religious conversion. <laughs> Uh, I had that that struck me as a striking um, insight, and I just appreciate it. Um, thank you for sharing it. Um, thank you. About Joseph, um, he was a very close friend, and um, um, I've lost a lot of people in the last couple of years, um, not from COVID mostly, but mostly just that I'm 80 and people start disappearing. and. Uh, the one that I wake up missing, like, I think I'm going to call Joseph because I want to talk about something. It's the only person of that group that it, uh, that it happens to me quite regularly. And um, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's quite a loss. Um, you know, David, David, I think that's, and he, he would be very consoled to hear that. You know, if you think of his last words, he wanted to be remembered. I mean, he, he, you are remembering him in a in a particular oh, yeah. way well, as someone as someone uh, to whom you would want to turn uh, with the deepest uh, losses. Who yeah. would have something that would not be beside the point, would not be trivial or meaningless or canned. You know, no, it's great. Um, I, I guess I think of that as one way of living the philosophical life. But um, uh, one final thing about Henry. Hi, Henry. Uh, mm -hmm remembers all the things you didn't do together. Of course, most of them involved organizing things, which is difficult. Um, I remember all the things we, the crazy things we did do. <laughs> like if, if we wanted to hear a conference, um, well, it was a conference in particular in Berkeley, a bunch of big people were gonna be there talking about Heidegger. We just jumped in the car and did it. <laughs> and uh, I, I think of that as just a wonderful gift uh to just be spontaneous like that if you want to learn something talk about something we did a lot of stuff like that and i really really appreciate it finally um about um, um tara and and uh, betty and uh I, I knew other members of um of the family i mean we live not far from each other and at one point i actually lived at their house uh, tara knows all about that um but um <clears throat> Um, um, 
they, they've recently suffered another loss. Uh, that is that Joseph's uncle, Cecil, um, who was married to his sister, um, Ronnie, who died maybe a year ago, I don't know, maybe two. She, he died too, and uh, Joy Deep, the, their son, would be, would be here with us, except that he's in India um, attending to the funeral of his uncle. It's a, it's a wonderful family, and it was a pleasure to get to know them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. You were a, a big part of our family and certainly a big part of my upbringing. <laughs> that's true in my mind you're still 46 but then i have to remember that i'm 46 so. yeah <laughs> you were still in high school yeah. so uh cameron you joined us late would you like to say anything sure i'd love to i thank you i'm so sorry i wasn't able to be here earlier today just uh just ended a class uh so i was one of the earlier students of Joseph, I met him originally in 1979 at Cal State LA, and it was a turning point in my life. There was a revolution happening, and we were all kind of turning away from civil engineering and industrial engineering to philosophy and ideas, and you know, and wanting to. So he was. I just remember sitting in the school cafeteria with him, and he was eating so elegantly. And we were having these lovely conversations together several times during that period, 1979, 1980. <laughs> so we were interested in the relationship of ideas and revolution and religion. And so, uh, you know, at the moment when, you know, the things were very fluid in Iran and, you know, we didn't yet have the horrible Islamic Republic that, you know, was uh, would come to power later. So, and I, I did meet him several times in the last few years. I, I met him about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when uh, he was uh, working on a conference of the World Congress of Religions. And he asked me if I could work with him a little bit on that. So I just have a lot of good memories from him. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate him for being there at that moment uh, to help guide us towards more philosophical thinking and ideas as well too. So just good to be here. I'm also currently an associate professor at Cal State LA in communication studies. So um, it took me of course, 15 years to go back to school and you know, become an academic, but uh, he did have a lasting impact on my life. Thanks. Anybody else? Well then, perhaps we should adjourn. Um, it was my pleasure to be the MC on behalf of the philosophy department. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, Betty and Tara, I will uh, be giving you the last words if you want them, or Jack or Don. I'll just say thank you again to the department and to you, David, for hosting this event uh, yeah. and to our speakers. My pleasure. Um, just so thoughtfully uh, weaving together so many elements of my dad's life and work. I, I know this is a, a real departure from uh, the direction this series used to take, but uh, we're really grateful to be able to uh, be here and to have this event one more time. Yes, I, I, the series, the lecture series was a very important thing for Joseph. And I remember March of 2019, where the last, was going to be the last lecture, this conversation between him and Jack Miles. And he says, well, it's not going to happen. And I don't think any of us had any idea at that time how long, what was, what was ahead for all of us. Um, and how long it would take before we would be able to sort of get back to what passes for a normal existence. Uh, and um, I'm glad we were finally able to have the final lecture. Okay, so I will, I will end the session and Tara will be in touch about the recording. 
And uh, thanks again, all of you, for, for coming. It was a lovely event. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Right. Thank, Thank you. God bless everybody.